So hello, everyone. Thanks so much for joining us today. Um, and thank you for taking the, the break from the news and 538 to join us. Um, so we're very fortunate to have Dr. Natasha Battaglia as our colloquium speaker today. So Natasha got her undergrad in physics from Cornell University and her PhD in astronomy and astrobiology from Penn State in 2017. She was a postdoctoral fellow at Space Telescope Science Institute and a UC President's postdoc uh, postdoctoral fellow at UC Santa Cruz. She's now a research scientist at NASA Ames, and she's an expert in exoplanet atmospheric modeling and how it connects with observational data. And today she's going to tell us about how uh, the, the newly updated models will allow us to interpret exoplanet spectroscopy from future telescopes. And for all of the, um, everyone attending, please keep yourself muted during the colloquium unless you have questions. And you can then feel free to unmute yourself and ask a question during the colloquium if you have one, or you can save it until the end, that's up to you. So please take it away, Natasha. Thank you so much for having me. And again, thanks for, I was uh, very, uh, I wasn't sure if people were going to show up because of the, you know, the crazy state of the world at the moment. So thanks for being here. Um, I feel free to interrupt me during the, the talk as I, I have lost complete control over my pointer. So I won't be able to point at anything. So uh, you just have to go completely off of what you're actually seeing in the slides. And so please stop me throughout it. Uh, if you have if you have a question or if something's unclear. So today I'm going to be talking about interpreting exoplanet atmospheres at the onset of this these next generation telescopes. Uh, JWST proposals are due in I think less than a month now and so people should be uh, gearing up for for writing new proposals and uh, experimenting with new data and high precision data that we'll be getting in the coming years and so I'm excited to talk about that. Um, we have been uh, kind of on this trajectory for the last few decades. Uh, you know, this, this NASA's plan to unveil the nature of terrestrial worlds, which really started with Kepler asking the very fundamental question of just, do other stars have planets? Uh, and, and, and if they do, could those be potentially habitable? And TESS just recently started to assess whether or not uh, uh, any of those planets exist nearby. Um, and, and, and of course, finding the, the, the closest planets nearby so that we can really ask um, and measure the composition of those planet atmospheres and ultimately uh, start to probe whether or not those planets exhibit the signs of life. Now, uh, of course, there is so much other science that we'd also like to do in conjunction with this. JWST in conjunction with the Roman Space Telescope and future TMT and whatever mission comes out of the decadal, um, will all work to together um, uh, to, to really understand exoplanets as a population, understand sort of universal chemical and physical processes that shape exoplanet atmospheres. Um, and, 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 you know, so we could really leverage atmospheres to Im improve our understanding of the origins of exoplanetary systems. And all of these things, um, in addition to assessing whether or not there are signs of life in exoplanet atmospheres, hinges um, on our ability to accurately and precisely measure atmospheric properties. So this could be things like chemical abundances or cloud properties, um, temperature pressure profiles, all those kind of nitty gritty things that we'll get into during this talk. So what does that look like? Um, so this starts with, you know, really fundamental data acquisition. Um, we get exoplanet atmosphere observations by observing planets in either a transit transmission when the planet is passing in front of the star or eclipse when you're seeing the, the bright thermal emission from the planet as it transits behind the star. Those will be the two fundamental ways that we'll be able to probe exoplanet atmospheres in the era of JWST. And then in conjunction with that, you can also um, look at planets uh, uh, directly in reflected light. And I should say that actually in a mission, um, you can also get reflected light information if you have uh, uh, optical, optical data. And so these three methods together can work to give you um, some sort of spectroscopic data. And once you have that data in hand, you can use um, a suite of theoretical models to, to make inferences of what you're seeing. And so traditionally we use a combination of 
chemical models, uh, climate models, cloud models, and spectroscopic models, which work together to give you a, a model spectrum or uh, a forward model. And once you have that, you can sort of um, explore parameter space in an MCMC or in a Bayesian framework to actually construct posteriors on the parameters that you're interested in. So here I'm showing just a, a little schematic of you know exploring chemistry parameter space like abundances um, and then climate parameter space like temperature uh, to, to, to retrieve your, your ultimate solution. And so in this talk, I'll be specifically be focusing on this theoretical modeling aspect um, and give you some intuition for what the state of the art in modeling is currently as we enter this next era of, uh, of spectroscopic characterization of exoplanet atmospheres. Now, what this looks like um, schematically is really you have your, your chemical models, your climate models, and your cloud models. Th those models all kind of are interdependent, right? Um, your, the presence or absence of clouds is going to affect your climate. The specific temperature of your planet is going to affect what abundances you have. Once you can iterate on those things back and forth and are happy with some sort of uh, some sort of resultant solution, you can plug those into a spectroscopic model, which depending on what geometry you're looking at, whether it be transmission or emission or reflection, can give you your um, your 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 ultimate spectrum. Now, there's a, a piece of this that we often don't talk um, uh, enough about, and that is, uh, oh, whoops, I. Totally. Um, so, of course, chemical models uh, produce abundance information. So, abundance as a function of pressure. Um, climate models produce, again, temperature as a function of pressure. And then, cloud models um, produce three key pieces of information a uh, continent, basically, the optical depth of your cloud as a function of pressure. Um, the single scattering albedo, which tells you how, how scattering, how bright your, your condensate particles are. And then the, um, this parameter that I'm labeling G here, which is the asymmetry parameter. And this is going to dictate how your particles scatter. So particles that are uh, highly forward scattering and have uh, asymmetry parameters near one are going to create this beam um, and, and, and they're going to have a higher probability of scattering in forward direction, whereas particles that are have asymmetry parameters near zero are going to have uh, isotropic scattering, meaning they're going to they're going to have equal probability of scattering in all directions. Okay. So the other the other aspect of theoretical modeling that is often um, not talked about uh, too much is the the lab the critical laboratory inputs that are needed for these models. So for chemical models, we need reaction rate constants, which tell us critical information about how each specific molecule reacts and combines to form other molecules. Um, for, for actually, for, for climate models and for spectroscopic models, we need opacity information. Um, these are the specific lias, which tell us about the transitions of each molecules and the partition functions. And then for, for cloud modeling, you need the condensate optical properties, which are going to vary widely depending on what type of cloud is condensing whatever atmosphere, whatever planet, whatever brown dwarf thing that you happen to be observing. Um, and so th this is really important because this is precursor work that we have to do before we even start doing theoretical modeling. And so I'm going to focus on uh, three aspects, um, the, the uh, opacity models, um, the cloud models, and spectroscopic models. Um, hopefully I'll have time to get to all three. If, if not, I might have to uh, drop one near the end. Um, but starting off, um, so we have these three key geometries um, that I'm going to talk about in conjunction, and hopefully this doesn't confuse people because we've we've uh, because direct imaging and, and reflected light observations really haven't taken off yet. We're not used to seeing sort of the critical information that reflected light spectroscopy gives us. Um, but here is the same planet, and I, I've I've taken just a kind of standard, I think a warm sub-Neptune type case just to show you what it looks like in all these different geometries. 
So in transmission, you're specifically looking at the, um, as a function of wavelength, the area of the planet with respect to the area of the star. And so as you move in wavelength space, there's going, your molecules are going to increase or decrease in opacity. Um, when you have large absorption, your planet appears bigger. And so you can see near you know, uh, three microns, we have this big whopping methane feature. And so the planet absorb, uh, it, looks to us um, much larger, um, short of one micron. Uh, and I apologize again, I can't use my pointer, but hopefully you're kind of understanding what I'm talking through. Um, short of one micron in transmission is where you get uh, kind of critical cloud or scattering information. And so you see this very cr characteristic slope that I'm showing there that is indicative of some sort of, uh, of Rayleigh scattering. Um, in this model that I've produced, it's Rayleigh scattering from hydrogen particles. Um, in transmission, you get, um, and I should, I should say that all of these different flavors of spectroscopy give you both um, redundant, but also um, uh, redundant and unique information. And so using all these three techniques together is really where you learn, where you can really start to learn a lot about planetary atmospheres or exoplanetary atmospheres. In transmission, um, the information that you get are the limb kind of high altitude abundances and temperatures. And this is because um, you're probing the light that's passing through the limb and you really can only see those upper atmospheric layers um, before you become optically thick. Um, in emission, you are looking at the, the flux of the planet, the thermal flux of the planet relative to the flux of the star. And so that's what I'm showing here. Um, short of, uh, at a, and I think this scale is in log, but short of one micron, you, you don't see a lot of thermal emission, but as you go towards longer wavelengths is where you start to get more information. And so JWST is really going to revolutionize uh, thermal emission spectroscopy of exoplanets compared to what HST has provided. Um, in uh, thermal emission, you get much more uh, um, uh, key information about the temperature pressure profile of the atmosphere. So as you increase in, as your, as your atmosphere becomes more optically thick, you're probing the upper atmospheric layers, which are cooler. And so you see a dip, um, th that's where you see this dip in absorption features. Um, the, the emission spectroscopy provides day side abundances because now you're looking at the day side of the planet. Um, it will provide an average, a day side average temperature pressure profile information, and then day side scattering properties. And I think I neglected to say this about transmission spectroscopy, but in transmission, and we'll talk about this more in depth, um, you get this very, uh, you get the cloud ex extinction information or the optical depth of the cloud. Um, lastly, uh, reflected light. So here I'm showing the flux of the planet. Now this is the reflected uh, light of the planet with respect to the flux of the star. And in reflected light, you have no temperature information, but you do have, um, you do get day side abundance information. You get those scattering properties as well. And in fact, refle um, reflected light is zeroth order um, completely determined by the scattering properties or the cloud properties within your atmosphere. And so when we talk about doing cloud modeling, it's going to affect reflected light spectrum or our choices in our cloud models are going to deeply affect the reflected light spectrum um, or our reflected light models. So this is what the sort of landscape of exoplanet atmosphere codes looks like to date. Um, you have, we have, there's several, almost dozen codes, and I, I'm sure that this is not a complete list. Um, the, of course, the, the, the first thing you'll notice is that not all, all, not all atmosphere codes compute all three geometries. And, and when you're, if you're shopping around for um, doing this kind of modeling, uh, that's the first thing that you should assess is what observing geometry am I interested in? Um, and, and what code can do those different things. Um, the, the, some of the earlier codes like uh, Nemesis and Atmo were developed for solar, were originally developed for solar system studies and have been kind of um, 
uh, warped for or kind of modified for exoplanet studies, those codes are not open source. But um, recently, there have been a lot of codes um, that have been developed in kind of the open source era. And you can see about half of these, half of these codes are open source, which is very exciting. Um, and I should mention that the you'll one thing you'll notice is that the availability of reflected light codes is obviously much less than the availability of uh, transmission and emission codes, and that is purely because um, the code development is very much spurred by data availability. And currently, the data that we have available to us is um, mostly HST spectroscopy um, in transmission in this re regime from about, from about 0 0.8 to 1, uh, 1.7 microns, which is HST with C3. So just to give you an idea of where we are with HST uh, spectroscopy, here is um, a little plot of just equilibrium temperature versus uh, planet radius. Um, and this is actually not, I think this does not include several of the new test systems, um, but in gray are uh, discovered planets that are brighter than J of 12. And those in pink are planets that have been followed up with Hubble WIFC-3 transit spectroscopy. Um, so you can see that there are, uh, we've probed several different kinds of planets in, in the last uh, 10 or so years. Um, we have uh, uh, terrestrial planets that have been observed with HST, uh, warm Neptune planets, and then a large population of hot Jupiters that have also been, um, that we also have uh, spectroscopy of. And so what that looks like, um, just th throwing all of these transit spectra up on a plot is something like this, where on the smaller planet radius end, you have the TRAPPIST system, where the data quality uh, is not yet uh, is not yet of high enough precision to really start ruling out various models. And so here I'm showing, um, you know, five, here this is a plot from Julian DeWitt's 2018 analysis of, of the TRAPPIST system. This is TRAPPIST-1e. Um, you can see that these are kind of very simplistic models, uh, hydrogen rich with a, a little bit of water absorption or a hydrogen rich planet with a little bit of methane. Um, or a or hundred percent water atmosphere. Uh, these are kind of just toy models, but you can see um, that this uh, that the the pr data precision cannot yet rule out uh, an H two or, or I, I think actually um, the the data was able to rule out specifically a hydrogen atmosphere. But further than that, um, you know, more detailed inferences could not be made. Um, and so looking forward to JWST, this is gonna be of course one, one area where we'll like to expand dr dramatically. So up here on the, 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 um, the larger planet side, this is a uh, hat P26 from Hannah Wakeford's analysis in 2017. And this is sort of um, the, the kind of gold standard in, in spectroscopy. Um, or, or you know, a, an example of a planet where there are two beautiful water features. Um, you can see one at around 1.4 microns and another one at around 1.1 micron. And then also here you can see some STIS photometry um, that is indicative of this planet being consistent with something that has, uh, you know, a high cloud layer. Um, and so this is kind of the state of the art with, um, with HST spectroscopy. And these codes have kind of developed um, with the availability of, of this data. Um, a lot of these spectroscopic codes were developed. Um, I, I have this timeline starting at the 90s. I think that's um, a lot of these, the codes specifically, the, the, the codes that were kind of grounded in solar system science, or even the codes that were grounded in sort of stellar radiative transfer, were developed well before that. Um, in the 70s, some were developed, were even developed on punch cards. Um, and once exoplanet uh, transmission spectroscopy came online, a lot of these tools were kind of warped, uh, changed so that we could do some of this modeling. 
Um, and throughout the years, these codes have been proved. There's been bug fixes. Um, one of the big immediate problems that needed to be solved was the speed of the codes because for exoplanet spectroscopy, we have very limited prior information. We have um, very little idea of what the temperature structures of these systems are. We have very little idea of what the chemical abundance or the cloud or any of these parameters. And so in order to um, retrieve properties, you have to put very large wide priors on your system, which means running your model um, hundreds of thousands of times. And so speed um, was something that had to be done early, uh, fixed for early on. Um, after that, people started doing interesting model comparison studies, codes became more flexible and complex. And then finally, just within the last three years is where you've seen this rise in, in open source uh, code development, which has been um, really awesome. And so moving into um, this JWST era where people are, you know, having to do proposal planning um, and, and, you know, and also plan for the next decade of missions, we have open source tools, they're flexible, they employ a variety of different methodologies, and, and, they're, and they're, most of them are well tested, which is a great place to be in. Um, and more than that, a lot of codes like Picasso and Playdon, which was developed in, at, at Caltech, um, and BART and, and several others were developed with the open source, um, with kind of the open source uh, problem in mind. And the open source problem is um, a unique one, right? First of all, um, bugs are, are no longer your own problem. And I don't, um, and so you need to pay more attention to testing. And by this, I don't necessarily just mean, um, you know, traditional type bugs that you might think about, like, um, you know, syntax errors or, um, or typos or things like that. Um, once you open source a code, you now have, um, you know, dozens or hundreds of people utilize, utilizing something in a way that you never thought that it might be utilized. And so having extremely rigorous testing um, and benchmarking is, is incredibly important in this new era of open source modeling. Um, for, for my own code, uh, this, was a, well, this was an especially difficult problem because, um, whoops, sorry, the, this code had been translated from an old um, Albedo model that was developed by Chris McKay in the 80s. Um, this albedo motto had been used for um, Titan spectroscopy over the last, you know, three decades or so had been used for um, Titan spectroscopy and Uranus spectroscopy and exoplanet spectroscopy and, and all of these different problems that by the time we went to, um, you know, when we, when we were thinking about rewriting it and redeveloping it, we really wanted to ensure um, that all of these previous problems that, that this code had, that had, you know, kind of worked with, um, that Picasso could reproduce them down the line. And, um, and so in order to do this, we developed, kind of scraped all of these, um, his, Historic is not a good word because I mean like the 70s or you know co or you know model output from the 70s and 80s and um, 2000s, but all of these different bodies of lit literature, we wanted to really make sure that um, we could run tests and and consistently reproduce what was um, what was computed you know 30 years ago or 20 years ago, et cetera. Um, and so those are those are all within Picasso and will remain there. So as we um, improve the rate of transfer or increase the complexity, we should always be able to go back to those fundamental problems and reproduce those things. So the next problem is documentation. Um, the the documentation of open source tools um, really does need to go sort of beyond what is included within sort of a, a traditional paper. Um, and in, in developing these open source tools, uh, one thing that, we've, that we noticed is that there is this break in understanding that happens between um, what's in a paper 
and and what's in a code. And and this is not necessarily just um, on the student level, although uh, it. It, it is certainly aids in understanding if there is more insightful documentation than having to lug through reading a paper and having to translate what's actually physically, you know, in some source code on GitHub. Um, and so to solve this problem with Picasso, we created this, um, this tool or this, you know, uh, derivation website that walks through the kind of walks through the radiative transfer problems. Um, and encoded, you can see, let's see if I can. Every time we define a new term, there is a, a respective hyperlink to a GitHub page um, where in the code that specific parameter is defined. And so this allows students to kind of hand in hand walk through a derivation but then also hyperlink to a code and understand how those parameters are physically being used within the code itself. Um, and I, I've heard some people say, oh, well, this is impossible because codes change. And so it would be really difficult to, to implement this kind of documentation um, kind of with, with larger codes or with, with codes in general. And um, the what I'll say is that in GitHub or in any sort of version controlled system, um, hyperlinks to code lines don't change. Uh, they will always remain there regardless of whether you update your code. So this specific link that I'm showing here um, is now maybe three or two versions behind, but this specific equation hasn't changed and the documentation still works. And so to that, I say it is totally possible to do this, um, this kind of documentation and I think it has been tremendously helpful uh, for students that have used um, this, uh, specifically Picasso. Uh, I've also um, worked with a couple professors that are using um, both Picasso and this, these sort of modules in, in the classroom as well to learn about various planetary atmospheres things. So I think in general has been um, very fruitful. So the last thing is that um, the assumptions in the codes need to be clear, uh, need to be made clear. And this is sort of going to be a theme throughout the rest of the talk as we move to higher quality data uh, uh, with over a larger span and wavelength range. All of these assumptions that have been kind of put into our codes are, are going to be brought to bear. And so it's super important when we're creating these uh, massively complex codes that we make these assumptions um, clear and explicit in codes uh, so that we can reproduce work you know, down the line or negate assumptions um, that have been proven to be incorrect. And so this is an example also within Picasso and we're gonna get into defining sort of the, the scattering terms and sort of the nitty gritty of, of how we're doing clouds. But I just wanted to show this example here. There, because of this problem with, with wanting to sort of um, be able to backtrack, you know, a, a decade or two decades ago work, we had to make sure that all of these assumptions that had kind of been, um, you know, commented and uncommented out throughout the history of this, of this code, um, we wanted to make those clear. And so there's a whole set of functionality just designed to highlighting what, you know, the assumptions in uh, Raman scattering are, the assumptions in our multiple phase functions or our assumptions in our single scattering options. And so people can easily loop through, you know, um, loop through all the assumptions in the code and actually see how their results are impacted. Um, when they're doing their, their interpretation or within, when they're interpreting spectra. And of course, this, what I'm showing here is reflected light spectra, um, which we won't expect to come, you know, come down the pipeline for, for you know, several years, but the same exact thing can be done for, uh, you know, transmission spectroscopy or emission spectroscopy, which will definitely um, need to be assessed in, in the next, you know, five years. And so this brings me to um, back to this plot showing all these spectroscopic codes. Um, you know, one of the one of the two big fundamental differences with all of these codes, and also why I kind of wanted to hone in on these two aspects of theoretical modeling, 
um, which were clouds and opacities, is, is how these different codes handle their scattering approximations, and then also how these codes handle um, and distribute their opacities. So as I said before, as input to all of these codes are um, critical opacities, several, um, actually most of these authors, and I, I apologize, I didn't, I, I couldn't locate and or didn't have time to go through every single one of these to, to, um, to, to you know, really show where all of these different things were located. I think I got most of the open source ones, um, you know, where they're listed. Some of some codes distribute their opacities through, um, you know, a service like Zenodo, which provides a or Zenodo or Open Science Framework, framework which provides um, a DOI um, associated with a data bundle. Other people provide them through Dropbox um, or their home institution server, um, and other people utilize, you know, GitHub has a uh, a data distributor as well that that allows people to do that. But there is no single um, you know, uniform way to th that kind of stores this information and distributes it, um, you know, w via query functionality or cloud service or, or something like that. Um, the other major differences between all of these codes is, is how they're handling the scattering, as I said. Um, and I was going to try and put, you know, um, some sort of icon to demonstrate all how all these different codes handle handle clouds and scattering approximations. I ended up just doing the two ends. Um, so on one extreme is the little stars. Those indicate codes that use um, you know some sort of multiple scattering approximation. And then I use the soccer ball um, to showcase some tools that use sort of analytic approximations. And those are just the two ends of the complexity spectrum. But there are several different flavors of how spectroscopic codes handle cloud modeling in between there as well. Um, so just to go through some of those, um, in transmission, Clouds are often treated as um, just a source of extinction. And so what I mean by that is that they can simply be treated as a, a, a cross section, or we can describe a pressure level where the cloud is sitting under which you can see, you know, you can't see anything else. Um, scattering is also often treated as a cross section, um, like a two parameter cross section. And so we we can parameterize the scattering behavior by um, you know just assigning a wavelength dependence as a function of alpha, which is like um, how Rayleigh behaves. So for you know, hydrogen Rayleigh or uh, hydrogen um, Rayleigh scattering, alpha is um, you know four. And uh, when I when I mean you know clouds are treated as only a source of extinction, what happens is you know a photon comes through the limb. If it gets absorbed, you don't see it. But then also, if it hits a cloud, you also don't see it. Meaning you don't have to tr track the um, the multiple scattering interactions that that photon may have. Now, this is in stark contrast to something like reflected in reflected light, where a photon comes in. Um, it can either be directly scattered out to the to the to the observer, or it can be multiple scattered. Um, throughout all of the different layers. And there can be multiple cloud layers as well, some more optically thick than others. And so when you start to, to treat um, clouds as, as they should be treated um, by assigning you know, the asymmetry parameter and the single scattering and the optical depth and you know, where the clouds are located, your number of model approximations begins to increase um, dramatically. And so um, in this scenario, a photon comes in, and this is uh, just the scenario for reflected light. A photon comes in, if it doesn't, if, if it gets absorbed, uh, you don't see it. Um, and if it hits a cloud, it can either be scatter scattered, you know, in an in, in isotropic manner, it could be scattered as, as uh, assuming some sort of pure Rayleigh function. Um, some people assume that it's, um, you know, purely asymmetric defined by a single parameter. So either it's highly forward scattering or back scattering. And then other, um, other codes kind of assume some combination thereof um, of, different, of different phase functions. And so you can see that this complexity is sort of highly increasing. And just to kind of show what this does to our spectrum. Um, so here, this initial spectrum that I showed, 
is the case of just pure uh, a pure cloud free spectrum in transmission and emission and reflected light. So now if I add just sort of a gray optically thick cloud, so something that is not wavelength dependent, um, I've chosen two different parameters, one a single scattering of 0.1. This is something, this would be a cloud condensate species that is very dark, that's not, um, that's not reflecting very efficiently. And then the other one in the orange is a single scattering value of 0.99. This would be something like a water cloud that's very reflective. So you can see that in transmission, um, regardless of what is happening with the single scattering albedo, um, the models are identical. And furthermore, you can see that basically I've assigned a, a pressure level of this gray optically thick cloud, and it's just cutting off all features, um, you know, shaving off all features below the, the that happen below that that um, that level, and so you lose kind of your Rayleigh scattering information, and um, your your absorption features get cut off. In emission, there's a there's a much different behavior that happens um, for these for this low scattering cloud species that that I've um, kind of that I've injected in this this gray optical cloud you can see that it's kind of almost appro approximating a black body, where in the case of highly scattering, you the, the, the scattering opacity of the cloud is interacting with the, the absorption features. And so you get kind of, um, you can actually see some, some absorption features in there. Uh, <laughs> just laughing at myself using my hands uh, instead of a pointer. Um, but, and then lastly, for reflected light spectroscopy, uh, clouds, like I said before, are sort of the zeroth order determinant to how, um, you know, to what the shape of your, your spectrum is going to be. So the case of this really bright sort of gray optically thick cloud, um, you get this really, really bright scattering um, spectrum that goes all the way out. And here it's pictured going out to 10 microns. In reality, uh, if I created, if I summed sort of the reflected light and the emission, the emission would totally swamp out the reflected light, uh, but I've chosen to just parse them out so you can kind of see the behavior. And then for the low scattering case, you can see you essentially just kind of approximate this um, very dark kind of uh, uh, flat line, so to speak, um, and you can barely see any absorption features down there. Now, if I swap in a physically motivated cloud, so here I'm defining physically motivated as something that just has sort of wavelength dependence, wavelength dependence in um, the single scattering and the asymmetry parameters. What you can see is that for an emission and then also in reflected light, um, your, your spectra, so the, the yellow line, starts to approximate the cloud-free behavior towards the infrared. And that's because um, clouds are not opaque throughout the entire wavelength region. And so you're starting to just kind of see the natural behavior of a cloud-free spectrum as you approach 10 microns. And down in reflected light, um, you're, you're again starting to get more interactions and, and um, this physically motivated cloud is of an actual condensate species. And so the single scattering parameter is a little bit different, but it just gives you an idea of, of what sort of, a, of what I'm calling a physically motivated model um, might do as opposed to something that's just purely gray and purely optically thick. Um, and, uh, the reason why a lot of these cloud assumptions and, and, and cloud modeling hasn't really been dealt with in exoplanet spectroscopy is just because of the data quality and the wavelength range that we have. So we're um, in the in sort of HST era spectra spectroscopy, we're often, often looking at this wavelength region between 1.1 and 1.6. Here I've um, put in sort of some HST quality spectra with respect to sort of this um, this gray cloud deck model, and I apologize, I've tried, I've I've used a similar color scheme, but these are different models. So here, the orange is a cloud-free model with an enhanced metallicity. So I've increased essentially. Um, here we're looking at 
uh, water absorption. And so I've increased the quantity of water absorption in the atmosphere. And now um, the mean molecular weight has been compressed. And therefore uh, my, my spectrum looks indistinguishable from a gray, from a simple gray cloud deck. And so uh, the simplicity in using sort of gray clouds to, to model spectra and, uh, and transmission is really warranted by the data quality that we have. Um, and this interplay between, uh, you know, getting poor metallicity constraints and poor cloud modeling constraints can be seen in the literature as well. Um, and so here is, here is an example, this is the case that I showed earlier of, uh, of the well-constrained he heavy element abundance of HAP-P26. Um, and this is sort of just standard, uh, standard modeling. Um, here is it, it, the, the final metallicity constraint of this particular system was 4.8 times solar or in log units 1.56. Now here on the right, I'm showing a table of all of the different um, retrieval analyses that were done in this, in, this, um, in this analysis. So they explored 12 different retrieval analyses utilizing 12 different parameterizations. And you can see that the constraint on metallicity, which is in that second column, varies tremendously. Um, sometimes it's, uh, you know, in the case of Model 8, it's negative 0.3. In the case of Model 7, it's 6. And the resultant metallicity constraint is sort of a marginalization over all of these different modeling uh, parameters. And so uh, we've been able to do this for HST quality spectra because it's really the, the best that we can do. Um, but when we move to JWST quality spectra, uh, all of a sudden, uh, we're going to get much higher precision data. We're going to get much higher resolution data, and and higher. That's going to result in higher constrained metallicities, higher constrained C to O ratios, and all of our assumptions, all of our cloud assumptions, and all of our other assumptions as well that we've been sweeping under the rug are going to come out. And so it's very important that we start to try and um, bring to light some of these assumptions that are in, 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 in our codes and in our analyses. Um, so moving on to sort of the cloud modeling aspect of this, um, we wanted to bring open source cloud modeling sort of up to par where spectroscopic models have, um, have been. And, <coughs> excuse me. So um, in the for cloud modeling, for physical cloud modeling, there are sort of two flavors of cloud modeling that differ in um, sort of the complexity of the assumptions contained within them. There are the top-down physical models um, that are, for example, Christian Helling's group or the, the Karma model, which Diana Powell and Pierre Gao have, have really kind of spearheaded for exoplanet work. These types of models include the really minute microphysics um, uh, th that is needed to really compute sort of scattering parameters within planetary atmospheres. There is also the sort of bottom up approach, which is more of a parametric model, um, which doesn't need to, you know, uh, is much simpler to run, it's faster, it doesn't need to be converged. This is the Ackerman and Marley cloud code. Um, and there's also one um, uh, developed by Charnay uh, called ExoREM. None of these, well, um, none of the bottom up approach models are open source. Karma is open source. However, people who use Karma will tell you it's very difficult to use. Um, you just have to be trained. Uh, you have to, um, you know, edit the model uh, within the code. It's not, it's it, not necessarily user friendly. It has to be re warped for the exoplanet problem, et cetera. And so we wanted to create an open source model that people could use. Um, the, the, the name of our open source new code, which is you can get on GitHub is called Virga. It was co-developed by Kiva uh, Rooney, who's a new NPP at NASA Ames, who unfortunately in quarantine times is stuck in Ireland um, where she is from. But um, so it's written in Python, um, but is as fast as the old Fortran version. 
it's uh, kind of retained, uh, uh, similar to how we did in Picasso, we've retained the original methodology that was in the, the Ackerman Marley code, but included several more updates um, to bring sort of some of the assumptions that were in the code to light. And you can see some of the documentation that's available online. Um, and just quickly going through this since I'm running out of time, but the um, Virga starts with uh, taking the, the, the innate cloud properties and computing a me scattering grid. And, and I brought this up in the very beginning that often we forget about um, the specific laboratory data that goes into doing this, this um, important modeling work. So here is just a, a quick image of sort of the um, imaginary and real components of the refractive indices in that are included within the code. And I wanted to highlight um, some, some just some key points where we're actually missing data. Uh, and so the in the JWST era, it's going to be critical to make sure that we have sort of these complete condensate optical properties and support the people who are doing this really important laboratory work. So using those um, me scattering properties, uh, Virga then computes, can compute the single scattering in the symmetry for the atmosphere that you're interested in. Um, this starts with, you know, um, with the initial assumption that sort of you'll have a cloud condensate wherever the, the condensate's partial pressure exceeds the vapor pressure of, of your atmosphere. And of course, in this model, we're omitting um, microphysics entirely. And so it, it, or required as input is the, of course, the pressure temperature pressure or profile, and then the eddy diffusion coefficient, which specifies the mixing. And then this parametric um, term, the sedimentation efficiency, which is going to describe the vertical extent of the cloud. Is it, is it, um, does it have a very large vertical, vertical extent or is it relatively compressed? Um, with those initial parameters, we can calculate the amount of condensate matter in the atmosphere by balancing the upward turbulent mixing of particles with the downward sedimentation. And then also the specific particle size of that condensate matter. Um, and then once we do that, we can we provide the users with um, the condensate mixing ratio, the mean particle radius, and the column density, which is what you need to get the parameters that ultimately go into your spectra, which is R, the extinction, the single scattering albedo, and, and the asymmetry. Um, and just to quickly, I'm, I'm coming up on 10 minutes and I wanna leave time for questions, but I just wanted to kind of highlight, going back to this sort of theme of assumptions in models, I wanted to highlight some of the assumptions that are, that are uh, encoded in this quite simple cloud model. So you have to um, assume a, a constant uh, parameter for this, this parameter F said, which, uh, and I mean constant with altitude, which determines the, the again, the vertical extent of the cloud. Um, for in computing the particle size of the condensate, you have to assume a log, or we assume a log normal distribution um, we also have to assume that the particles are spherical, which is not necessarily the case. This is something. Um, and then also you have to assume an approximate um, drag force uh, um, functional form, which is not, which is not necessarily trivial. Um, and also assumes that of course the particles are spherical. And um, once you do this, then you can, you know, you can finally get this full description of what the cloud properties are doing within within your model. And this is just a, a quick example of what that looks like. So these are, you know, varying the upper panel is I'm varying the distribution of the particles and the bottom panel is I'm showing an example of varying um, this this term, the F that this F said term. And the reason why I wanted to show this and kind of highlight these assumptions is because uh, in, in the era of JWST quality data, we are really going to want to use you know, models like this to actually retrieve physically motivated cloud information. And so this is some work by um, uh, Sagnik Mukjeri, which uh, who is a first year at uh, UCSC. 
and he is investigating um, sort of uh, different parameterizations for doing cloud retrievals in reflected light. And so you can see here, he has um, the, the black, this is an example, high precision reflected light spectrum. And he is the, the, the black vertical line is the input parameter that was computed with Virga. And the orange, the dark orange is the one sigma constrained profile and the light orange is the two sigma constrained profile. So you can see that in this, this um, just this particular case, you're able to make inferences about uh, the number of cloud levels and you know, rough information about the asymmetry and the single scattering parameters that are included within this. Um, and, and although this case is particular uh, to reflected light, you can also imagine doing similar analyses for transmission spectroscopy and emission spectroscopy or um, the joint of the two. And so I'll stop there to take questions and um, just put up these, uh, you know, last thoughts in the era of HST, the, 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 the different or model differences and model assumptions can generally be relaxed because of the data quality that we have had. Um, but these all these sort of specific model differences are really going to come to light with JWST era data um, and clouds specifically are going to drastically affect um, the spectra, depending on how they're handled or how those scattering properties are handled in, um, in the, in the spectro spectroscopic models. And moving forward um, in JWST, we should really be transparent with all of these different modeling assumptions, especially when we're developing new open source codes. Okay. Thank you very much, Natasha. Yeah. Um, Oh yeah, and Mansi's just reminding everyone, please raise your hand in the, um, in the uh, Zoom window if you'd like to ask a question. Um, I see that Carl has a question. I'm gonna kick off the questions if that's okay. <laughs> um, so I wanted to ask you about um, reflected light planets. Uh, so in your models that you showed, it, it looks like you're you know, comparing with really high spectral resolution data, but um, something like Roman CGI, we're expecting something like a resolution of 50. So yeah. can you say something about what kind of, what can you say from those really broad, can you say something about really broad features or something? What can you say from that? For sure. So, um, so we've, we've done uh, analyses of these, um, not, so at, at the level or at the Roman spectra data quality um, and resolution, you're getting very coarse information. Um, the information that you can basically get out is essentially the slope of the line. You know, is it a negative slope? Is, is it consistent with a zero slope or is it consistent with positive slope? And that might seem like nothing, but for reflected light spectroscopy, it's actually really, uh, it's actually really interesting information. If I go back to sort of that initial cloud free, uh, let's see, where, where was that? So, um, when you have sort of this, this zero sloped, uh, if you get out this zero slope spectra, it's indicative of uh, an atmosphere that's essentially pure Rayleigh scattering. And when you introduce clouds, especially bright clouds, bright water clouds that you'd expect from Roman like planets, you get this characteristic zero slope because clouds have essentially no wavelength dependence in their single scattering or asymmetry properties fr from zero, you know, 0 0.5 ish to one micron. Um, and so, although you can't get out very specific, you know, high quality, you know, pressure dependent information regarding the specific abundances or the specific cloud properties, what you can get out is zero order information about where your cloud is sitting relative to your, um, to the Rayleigh scattering opacity relative to your molecular opacity. And that the combination of those three things kind of gives you this, this really, really zero third or slope information, which is still very interesting. Um, okay, thank you. Um, so we have Carl, you can ask your question. You can also turn your video on if you'd like. Uh, hi, can you hear me? Yes. Yep. Okay, hi Natasha, thank you for this talk. It's really interesting, especially the summary of all the different model codes out there. Uh, in the community, I had no idea of the full scope of it. I was wondering if you could say if the community is just allowing each other to see what the individual groups are doing or are people kind of rallying 
in joining uh, the use of one or two particular codes and growing a user base for them beyond just the originators of those codes? That's a really interesting question. Um, I don't know that I have a great answer for you yet. Um, I can say from my personal experience, like I, uh, I have used, you know, as a student, I used Chimera because I was used, I was working with my client and then developed uh, my own code to do reflected light spectroscopy and sort of have used those two as validation back and forth between, so even as the developer of a code, I tend to like using other codes to validate what I'm doing. Um, I know that there have been other model, you know, kind of in-depth model comparison codes between some of these other groups. I don't know, I don't have a sense if there is one singular tool that people are rallying behind. And in my opinion, I don't necessarily think that is a, a bad thing. I think that's actually a good thing if analyses are done with several different models. Um, I think it would be a little bit dangerous to use one singular code for, for everything because, um, you know, there could be bugs or, you know, you always want to be able to validate against something else. Um, yeah. Okay, thanks. And, and if I could be permitted a second question, um, just one about reflected light, I've always wondered. Um, let's say we have a, a small planet that has a significant ring system. So how is that going to mess up our conclusions about the properties of the atmosphere of the planet? Is it going to just act like a big cloud layer that, that obscures the absorption features or uh, is something else like that? Uh, yeah, that's super interesting. Um, I don't, I have never done any specific modeling myself. However, I assume that um, Emily Martin's P's uh, new instrument will probably give us really good information regarding that specific question about how a ring system might interfere with a reflected light spectrum. Okay, thanks very much. Thanks, Carl. Uh, Sarah, you have a question? You can unmute um, yourself and turn your video on. Hey, uh, thanks for this awesome talk. Um, apologies if I missed this, but uh, how much does the assumption of spherical shapes for the particles affect the spectra, I guess, if at all? Yeah, no, you didn't miss out at all. I, I don't even think I mentioned that. But um, so the, the, there, have, there has been really good work done by um, uh, Kazumasa Ono, who has, who has looked at some of these aggregate particles. Um, essentially what it does is increase the, in reflected light, it increases the, uh, let me go back to, um, um, so I think in trans, if I'm remembering correctly in transmission spectroscopy, it, it'll increase the, uh, essentially the extinction or increase the opacity of the entire cloud layer. Um, in, uh, ref in reflected light, and basically like the, in, in reflected light, I think it would have more specific wavelength. It, the, the sort of non-spherical particles, particles would have more interesting wavelength dependent information. Um, but whether or not you could actually, you know, discern between a spherical particle or not just on spectra, on, you know, transmission or emission or reflected light spectroscopy, you know, alone, I, I'm not sure. It might be degenerate with, you know, with some other parameters, like particle size, for instance. Thanks. Thanks, Sarah. Uh, we have a question from Michael. Do you want to unmute yourself and turn your video on? Hello. Hi, Natasha. Hi. <laughs> yeah, so I was wondering, um, have you thought about the emission and reflection spectra of like rocky bodies without an atmosphere? And like whether you can learn anything about that from JWST. Um, you mean without an atmosphere entirely? So, uh, let's see. In emission, so you mean? Do you mean like from a phase 
from a phase curve or do you just mean from observing the the like the innate black body spectrum of the of the planet yeah just from the secondary eclipse depths uh, maybe from the reflection spectra in the optical um i would assume that the th so the for reflected light specifically the features that you would get from the surface features that you would get in reflected light i imagine would be really tiny so i don't think that um and then of course for jwst we just don't have the optical to be able to look at the reflected light from an eclipse spectrum and so yeah. that would be additionally a, a constraint um in emission though you could do you know something similar to laura kreidberg's lhs an analysis and you know, look at a phase curve and try and make inferences about what the surface properties are. Um, it's possible though, like actually being able to discern various compositions, I think would be really difficult though. Mm -hmm. But but an interesting problem to work on. Cool, thanks. Yeah, let's hope we have that issue. <laughs> <laughs> All right, I don't see any other questions. Um, and we are just past the hour, so that's basically perfect timing. So thank you again so much, Natasha, for your wonderful talk. And um, uh, I know we all enjoyed uh, hearing it. And I'm going to pass it over to Andrew Howard, who I believe is the uh, faculty lead for the um, 